it. So uh, on behalf of myself and my co-chair, Hamlata Mystery, I'd like to welcome everyone to the education platform session at the Drosophila Research Conference. Um, we've got a really great set of talks to uh, put together today, and we're really excited about it. Um, so this session will be recorded, just so you all know, um, and we will be following the GSA Code of Conduct for this session. Each presenter will have 15 minutes to present, uh, 12 minutes of presentation, three minutes for questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to as many as possible. Any unanswered questions will be given to the speakers for them to answer. So let's get started. Our very first speaker to kick us off is Andreas Prokop from the University of Manchester. Andreas, please could you share your slides? Yes. Should be this one. So can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, I can. It is all yours. Good. So thanks a lot, first of all, Hemlata and Justin for this great opportunity to present the Manchester Fly Facility. So, oops, let me click on my screen. So how I usually start my public talks to public audiences is this question, how many legs does a fly have? Of course, it's trivial. It's an insect, so six legs. How many wings does a fly have? And there, of course, you get split audiences. Most insects have four wings, but flies are, of course, diptera, so they have two wings. They said we can bring, of course, back with Drosophila genetics, the second wing pair. The next question then normally uh, finds no answer and just guesses how many Drosophila researchers got the Nobel Prize. And of course, it's then astounding to hear that there are nine, uh, arguably 10 Nobel laureates, so five, arguably six uh, Nobel Prizes that were uh, won for work with Drosophila. And all of these were Nobel Prizes in physiology or medicine. And this, of course, raises the question why research in a fly uh, can be so important. Now, we've got a whole number of books describing the fly phenomenon. However, as Martin Brooks points out, we seem reluctant to accept that this tiny creature can teach us anything, let alone anything about ourselves. And this, of course, this reluctance includes clinicians, non-fly scientists, politicians, fund-giving organizations, and so on. So, of course, formally, uh, there is political and institutional support for science communication. I'm listing here just two for the UK and Germany. And I'm sure in America, there are similar, uh, similar things going on. But those who are actively engaging actually know about the enormous challenges we are facing. And especially when, when uh, communicating fundamental sciences, we often have the problem that audiences are not immediately affected or uh, concerned by the matters that we are talking about. Very different from, for example, medical outreach. So in order to meet these challenges, uh, me and Sam Ellingworth published a, a special issue about science communication in the field of fundamental biological uh, biomedical research, which in the first two years had 55,000 downloads. And uh, in here, we are driving this idea of that we can meet the challenges through objective driven long-term initiatives. And we are providing a number of examples how this can be achieved. And the example I would like to talk about today is the Manchester Fly Facility, which we launched together with my close colleague Sanjay Patel in 2011, so exactly 10 years ago. So we've got our first uh, decade anniversary. So we are objective driven. We want to raise awareness of the importance of fly research as an efficient and economically responsible pillar for discovery processes in the biomedical sciences. And we have a long-term strategy which is three-pronged through Drozo for Research, Drozo for Public, and Drozo for Schools. The first one of these, Drozo for Research, has as its main engagement strategy, our genetics training package, which by now has 41,000 downloads across three platforms. 
And I've got many, many uh, very positive feedbacks from across the world. So this training package is designed for newcomers, uh, for researchers coming new to the fly, providing high quality training, uh, taking load of us, of our shoulders as, as uh, PIs, um, but also but also um, it, because it is um, uh, self-study self based. It also can be used as an active genetics training package in university classes and courses. So for example, I at the moment teach 60 undergraduates on a course with this training package. And of course, if we all would do this, we could educate thousands of people and prime them for Drosophila. So enormous power that could be coming from this. The second strategy of implementation is to address non-specialist audiences to promote the wider awareness of Drosophila research. And here, for example, we've got our webpage, the Drosophila Public webpage, which is a one-stop shop for advocacy, where you can find all kinds of outreach resources that I have become aware of, and they are linked out there immediately. So if you have any resources, please send them to us and we help you to, to share them with the world. We are also the webpage under the public teachers and students icon on Flybase. The second part of this strategy is to develop outreach resources. And you see here eight science fair activities, for example, which are ready for you to download from this uh, Figshare repository. Or we have our educational videos, the small fly big impact videos, which have been translated by others already into Spanish, Indonesian and Arabic and Portuguese is underway at the moment. And there are many, many other resources that we developed, including even a computer game um, about the battle of fly, raising fly against mites and mold. So again, these resources are used across the world on really six continents, as we know from emails being sent to us. Now to take outreach to an even, uh, to, to, to yet another level, uh, I developed or initiated together with Stuart Allen, uh, the Brain Box event, which was a single day event in Manchester uh, on, in 2016, which attracted 5.4 uh, thousand visitors uh, on a single day. And on this event, uh, we had themed neuro themes, different themes on the neuro topic in which Drosophila activities were embedded in each of them. So for example, we had fly climbing essays next to neurosurgeons demonstrating how to cut open a skull. Uh, and that this really worked was shown by the evaluation that 12% of people highlighted flies uh, as an attraction. Now, the further, a further part of this outreach strategy is to collate ideas for elevator pitches, so to develop, develop simple, efficient, scientifically sound explanations. They are available to all of us to talk to politicians, to talk on, on grand panels, to talk to your, to your grandparents. So that this really works was also shown in 2017, where after the Nobel Prize, uh, there were several articles about Drosophila, which then used our materials. And in this way, you could make sure that the, the statements made were efficient, as well as scientifically sound. The third pillar of our implementation strategy is our schoolwork, uh, formalized in the Joseph for Schools initiative. And this basically has its, its main strategy that we use Drosophila as a tool to teach the biology curriculum. So in this way, we don't talk about flies, but we teach the curriculum with flies. So it comes to students in a more natural way. We, for example, use micro experiments in classes and funny anecdotes available for Drosophila and that way make those classes entertaining, memorable and exciting. To implement this, we send uh, university students as teaching assistants into schools, and we develop them together in collaboration with teachers school adequate resources. To disseminate them, we either take them ourselves into the schools and our visits, and uh, the other way is that we have ready to use lessons and teacher support materials available online. And of course, we publish these results, uh, these strategies uh, in various um, articles. 
Now, for example, we have so far in Joseph School seven uh, lesson packages, and these seven uh, packages were all translated into different languages through other groups. They are all made available on, uh, on our dedicated FigShare resource site. So we have, for example, micro experiments involved here, like the student dissecting either wild type or ADH deficient uh, maggots and then doing enzymatic stainings. Or you see down here, these animated GIFs illustrating an action potential, which is part of our five steps to an action potential package forming part of the neural lesson. Now, uh, to, we, when we go into schools, we use this to test our resources. And we did so far about 90 events. And one of our flagship events was this one, which we do, did in two consecutive years before COVID, where we saw 160 students on a day from eight different schools, uh, all seeing four curriculum relevant lessons. And how this all was done with only eight people in our team is all explained in this PLOS SciComm blog. Now that this again works is nicely illustrated by this evaluation where we, for example, see that do you think that Rosophila is an attractive organism to be used in biology lessons, overwhelmingly positive, or do I think that simple model organisms are important tools for scientific discovery, again, very positive, or just read this statement, I never really thought that a fly could be useful, but I see the potential now. Of course, this is exactly what we want to achieve. Now, we are happy to collaborate uh, with whomever, whoever wants to drive uh, Drosophila advocacy. And as you can see here, we have now partner initiatives across the world, like in Latin America, Turkey, Croatia, Nigeria, and Indonesia. And of course, this said, there are, of course, other initiatives, like, for example, Trend in Africa or Jos Africa or Amos Drosophila Research and Training Center in Nigeria all of whom we are collaborating with. So as the key message, and this brings me to the end, it's really, let's collaborate if it is about Drosophila outreach, Drosophila advocacy. Share your ideas and resources. Don't reinvent the wheel, build on and enhance what's there already. So if we do this really as an advocacy community across the globe, I think we can drive the presence of Drosophila in normal society at much higher power than if we all do our little thing here and there and basically distribute activities rather than focus them uh, on one common um, uh, effort. So finally, I would like to acknowledge my close colleague, Sanjay Pante Patel, with, without whom this all would not have been possible. And of course, the funding and the, the support from colleagues at Manchester and around the world. Uh, this talk will, of course, be available through, uh, through the ADRC site, but we also make it available on the Joseph for Public um, resources page. And if you're interested in further uh, publications about uh, science blogs and articles and web pages, uh, just go to this site and you will find that information. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andreas. So let's stop sharing, yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. So uh, I encourage folks to uh, put their questions in the Q&A box. So we have a question for you. So uh, Drea says, uh, great work, and, thank, and she's thankful for the resources you have available online. Um, have you had the opportunity to do this type of outreach remotely, especially during the pandemic? Uh, so far, we haven't done so, but um, for example, at the moment I'm teaching um, our undergraduate course, so second year undergraduates, and um, I mean there we are doing, for example, our training online, which is very easy to do. In other occasions, live, we would have done it in the laboratory, so in between uh, times when they have incubation times, they just uh, solve the next, class, uh, the next task, we are available for them, so these things are of course possible. Uh, with schools directly since COVID, we haven't done uh, any classes online, no. Uh, but I'm pretty sure because it's all PowerPoints, it would be very easy to, to implement. But do you think it would lose something? I mean, so do you actually, I'm assuming you bring live flies into the classrooms or is it all just 
right? I mean, you bring we are bringing flies, life right? flies into classrooms. So, so, for example, we shake epileptic flies into seizure, or you have you have temperature sensitive flies which you which you paralyze. Uh, we we do uh, experiments with with ADH deficient flies. There's a whole range of things, um, um, visual, so with working with light diodes. Uh, we do climbing essays, which is very loved by teachers because uh, they can do statistics and really do exper experiments with biological objects to so then uh, perform statistics. So that might be a challenge to do remotely. Or that, of course, would be a challenge now unless you point a camera at something and then demonstrate it live in that way. Okay, so I think in, uh, for time, we should uh, move on. Thank you, Andreas. You're welcome.